Hi, welcome to this week's edition of the Pool Guy Show. Today I'm going to be talking about some rookie mistakes you may make out there in the field as you're first starting out in the business. I'm going to offer you some tips and some ways to avoid some common mistakes. This week's podcast is brought to you by InYourPools.com. InYourPools has been helping pool owners find the right pool parts in 2001. With over 50,000 pool parts in stock, order online today and have the parts delivered right to your door. And the podcast is also brought to you by Riptide Pool Vacuum System. The Riptide is a powerful vacuum system that pulls heavy debris off the bottom of the pool rapidly. So if you do pool service, this is a great tool to have if you work in an area where there's a lot of wind and heavy debris. And if you're a homeowner, this is a great tool to have also if your pool gets a lot of heavy debris on the bottom every week. You can learn more about the Riptide at RiptideVac.com. So I started a coaching program about a year and a half ago where I help people that are just starting out in the business or those that are in the business for a while to get uh, more acquainted with different aspects of the pool service industry. And from this coaching site, I've helped a lot of people start their business. And um, I'm going to go over some of the mistakes that you can make when you're starting out as a new uh, pool service professional. So I think the first thing is how you present yourself when you go to make a bid with a new client. And if you join my coaching site, I can actually help you uh, do some marketing and different ways to acquire accounts. Um, but basically, um, the interview with the client is the most important part of the bid. So a lot of the times, um, looks are everything, basically. If you show up at the bid and you look nervous or unsure of yourself, uh, chances are you're not going to land the account. And I think one of the ways that a lot of guys will make a mistake is they'll talk too much during the interview. They'll just ramble on or... Um, over over answer the questions that are asked to them so be clear and concise when you do your bid make sure that all the services that you're going to do are outlined and that you don't over talk yourself and talk yourself out of the bid itself um, in real estate they call that talking yourself out of the deal and some realtors will talk too much give too much information and the homeowner will walk away from the purchase so um, don't talk too much just answer the questions uh, be concise and clear on what the services are and as you're doing an interview process, you're also assessing the customer. Now, when you're starting out, you want to take as many clients as you can, of course, because you need, you need the accounts, you need the money. But you're also assessing the customer if you can actually work with this person long term, year to year. And if the customer is rash and harsh, um, you may not even want that account. And uh, someone asked me, how do you turn down an account graciously? And you just tell the customer, well, you know, your your house is a little bit out of my service area, so I'm going to have to pass, but I can refer you to someone else who does service in your area. And just keep it simple like that. Um, you know, one customer one time when I did a bid, they wanted, uh, he was an attorney, and the first thing he asked me was for a copy of my liability insurance. And, you know, all the red, all the sirens went off in my head and all the red flags popped up. And so I just gave him that little talk about being out of my service area because I don't think I can deal with um, that type of customer long term. And if there's any issues, um, I would probably be served with some kind of lawsuit, I'm sure. You're also going to assess the uh, premises also to make sure that there are no uh, vicious dogs. The last thing you want to do is take a service account where the customer has to lock their dog up every week. That's definitely a no-no. Just let someone else handle that account because chances are the dog's going to get out and the dog's going to attack you. I've been bit several times on my route by dogs that weren't quite vicious, thank goodness, but they still bit me. So even a normal dog in, cer in certain circumstances can attack and bite you. So if they do have a vicious dog to begin with, then you don't want to take that account because a door can be left open. The dog, they can tell you the dog is locked up when it's not. And I find that the uh, usually the very vicious dogs are, are pretty quiet sometimes too and they can sneak up on you. So another thing that may happen as you're starting out is you're taking too many accounts that are really bad. And what I mean by bad are that the uh, water chemistry is always out of balance because um, things aren't weren't maintained properly. They have old equipment or the account has a lot of trees over it so there's a lot of leaves falling in. Again, your main goal is to acquire accounts when you start out. However, if you have 
um, a dozen of these or 20 of these accounts on your pool route, um, your day's going to be super long and you're not going to really enjoy this job. So it's okay to take accounts on as you're starting, but some of these accounts you may want to drop as soon as you can um, as you get new accounts that are better, the pools stay cleaner, they're a lot easier to manage. Um, you don't want to keep a lot of these um, hard service accounts on your route, but do get them when you start out. But just remember that these are probably temporary accounts just to pay the bills because uh, it's going to be a long week if you're doing you know, 20 or 30 pools that are really hard to clean every week. Um, so you can have a few on your route. I have a few on my route, but you don't want too many of these. And when you start out, you want to have a specific service area that you're going to accept pools in. So uh, one of the things you want to avoid is taking too many pools out of your service area. You're just pretty much spinning your wheels if you're going to be driving, you know, eight miles one way to do one pool and then four miles back to get back in your territory or five miles back to another pool um, at the border of your territory. So try to make it as tight as possible. Um, you could take some few outlying accounts at the beginning, but just know that they're temporary also and you're going to try to uh, tighten your route up as you build more accounts. So you want to make sure you avoid that mistake of having too many outlying outliers on your route, um, causing you a lot of time driving because time is money. And then um, another thing is when you do the initial bid of the account, you take into account all the factors, usage of the pool, um, trees over the pool, the size of the pool, and you don't want to bid the account too low. If you bid the account too low to begin with, um, it's hard to say Oh, hi, Mr. Jones. Uh, I know I said it was $95 a month, but I realize now that with the chemicals I'm using every month and the size of the pool, it's going to be $115 a month now. That doesn't go over too well, and most of the times you have to absorb the losses at first and then maybe wait a year or a year and a half and raise the service rate up to a more acceptable level. So the initial bid is critical. You want to make sure you do the uh, bid so that you're going to make money and you're not just out there spinning your wheels. The question I often am asked is, how do I know how much to bid on a service account? Um, there's a lot of factors. You can definitely join my coaching group. You can email me, and I'll also help you um, through the email on bidding, getting an idea of how much to bid in your area. Um, one way to know is to check your area to see what the other service companies are charging for their services. And every area is different. There are some areas in Florida where the going rate is $85 a month. Other areas where it's $120. So it's area specific as far as the rates. I have a lot of guys on my, in my coaching group from Arizona, Texas, Florida, uh, areas of California. So I can get a good idea of how much uh, each area is charging for their services, but you don't want to underbid. And then for commercial accounts, I can also help you um, get a bid together for a commercial account. It's a little bit different when you're bidding commercial accounts, and you definitely don't want to lose money while you're doing commercial uh, pool service apartment or a condo or any kind of hotel kind of pool. So the bidding is a little bit different there also. And I can help you with that um, through my coaching site or if you email me, I can also give you some assistance there. So the bidding is important. You don't want to bid too low because raising the, the rate three months down the road is uh, generally not, not a good idea. It doesn't look too professional. Uh, the next thing is a service agreement. You want something simple drawn up, um, stating what you're going to do each week. And then you're going to also have what the customer is required to do add water to the pool, make sure the pool is accessible every week and that you're able to get in there, things like that in a service agreement. That way there's no misunderstandings. Also in the service agreement, you can also put um, how many uh, vacation days you take every year and when you take your vacation days. That way they know when the pool is not going to be serviced that week. So those are all important things to have in a service agreement. It's not binding. It's not a legal document that's going to bind you like a contract, but it's just something that um, will let the customer know what to expect from your service and what they're expected to do uh, week to week to make sure that um, everything is uh, dialed in on your end and their end. So another thing that uh, people starting out forget to do is to build a website. You don't have to have a massive website, but you do need to have a website. A website makes you look professional. Um, when you have a business card, you give it to your, your potential client and they can look at your website. On your website, you should have your service rates listed there. Generally speaking, the service rate is not specific, but generally what each level of service um, roughly costs. And uh, of course, you want to put some exceptions there. So definitely a website is good. And also, if you're going to advertise with a, anything like Google AdWords, I think it's called Google Ads now, 
I'm going to be changing the name of that, but it was it used to be called Google AdWords. It's only a website so that people can land there with the Google Ads. So website is definitely a must. It's very affordable. I have a guy that can build you a website uh, really affordably, or you can uh, use Wix.com and build a website for about $150 a year as the uh, cost of the fees. You can build a free one, and uh, those have their ads on your site. So you can go either way. I prefer you paying for your website. That way you don't have um, any kind of server ads on your site. It looks a little bit more professional when you actually pay for your site. And with that said, a lot of uh, service guys starting out, they're younger, so they're tech savvy. And one thing that I've noticed, I've seen going to different websites is um, there's a lot of fake reviews on there from people from Yelp and from um, other sites where they review for, from Google. Um, you could you can pretty much garner a lot of fake reviews from friends, relatives. You can buy reviews from um, companies. I really would recommend not doing that, um, mainly because of the honesty aspect of it. If you have fake reviews, then the customer can't trust you as far as your honesty level. And um, fake reviews just don't make you look good. Um, people can spot them pretty easily. If you see a service company with uh, 50 reviews, they're all five star. Um, because generally people don't leave reviews. Most service companies will have maybe five to ten reviews on their site, which is um, pretty normal. You know, if you've been in business for five years, you may have like 30 reviews. So just let the honest reviews come in gradually. Um, you're going to get most of your customers from word of mouth anyway. So the fake reviews just make you look phony, basically, and doesn't really add anything except maybe some false uh, clout to your business. And I don't really like fake reviews anyway when I go somewhere, when I'm looking for a carpet cleaner. I want to make sure that the reviews are legitimate. So um, it's just bad for the overall business, uh, internet business, by having fake reviews. But a lot of guys do it, and they think that it's helping boost their business up, when in reality it's hurting the whole industry because you're you're um, saturating the market with some fake reviews, and the legit, legitimate reviews aren't being seen. And I just don't agree with doing that. And that's just my little two cents, my soapbox there on that. Um, so yeah, keep everything as real as possible. And you want to have some build up some good customer relationships so that when you do do a bid, you can give out their phone number and then the potential client can call them and ask how the service is. And I think that's the best. Have like three or four customers that are outgoing and are willing to do that for you and offer them something free. You know, do a if you charge for filter cleaning twice a year, offer them one free filter cleaning a year if they are willing to be a reference for you. And that's fine. I mean, it takes them time and out of their day to field phone calls. And um, it's definitely worth giving them something at least um, to help you build your business up. And it's not a kickback. It's just a way of appreciating them helping you by being willing to talk to someone about your service. And that's perfectly acceptable. And I think that's the best way to build your business is with referrals anyway. And um, having that in your back pocket is a good a good thing. And then I'm going to go touch on a few um, things about time on your route. So I see a lot of guys out there not using the right equipment or using really cheap equipment. Um, it's okay if you're starting out and you're on a budget. I understand that. But understand that equipment is probably the key to your business and key to um, your time out there on the route. It's very frustrating if you're, you know, skimmer, your leaf rake breaks or your brush breaks out there, or if you don't, if your tools aren't working properly, um, you definitely want to invest in some good quality tools and equipment. And remember that the equipment for your business is a tax write-off. So for the first two or three years, you may not show a profit in your business because you're buying a lot of equipment, doing a lot of advertising. So keep that in mind that um, as far as um, buying equipment, you can write it off in your taxes anyway, and it's a good way to offset your self-employment income. So invest in the equipment that you need. Don't go into debt doing it, but don't shy away from buying equipment because the costs may seem um, not acceptable at the, at the beginning of your service or when you're first starting out, you don't want to spend a lot of money. But you definitely need the right equipment, and spending the money will pay off as far as time savings. So you're going to speed up the day out there, and you're going to be able to get more service accounts at the same time. So with the proper equipment, you can speed up your day and maximize your time, creating more income because you're going to have more service accounts each day. 
So I think investing in equipment is a must, and I think it's the wrong attitude to be focused on a dollar amount versus how it can enhance your business and grow your business. So for instance, um, the Riptide pull vacuum system, um, part of joining my group, you get 10% off that system. The retail price of the system with the cart is like $1,600. And then you gotta buy the battery for another uh, 65 to $100. And then a charger, so you're looking at you know, 17, 1750 for a vacuum system. And that seems like a really large investment. However, by using it on your route, a pool that would take you 30 minutes takes you 10 minutes. And you can take on accounts that normally would pass on because of all the debris in the pool. And it just speeds up your day. And so instead of doing 10 accounts per day, you can do 20 accounts per day. And that $1,700 price tag is paid for within the first year because you just doubled your business out there in the field. So you got to look at it that way when you're investing in equipment. It's definitely an investment and it's an expense, but it's something that's going to pay dividends in the time saving and how you can quickly build up your pool route. So uh, don't shy away from spending money when you first start in the business. I get what you need and get the right equipment for sure. I'm going to talk about some things you don't want to do when you're bidding a service account. Um, you don't want to offer someone a discount for the first month of service. You're going to attract the wrong kind of customers by offering a um, cut rate. So you can offer a free filter cleaning after six months or offering them some kind of free product, anything besides um, you know half off the first month or one month free. Because generally the people that go for that deal are going to be people looking for bargains and uh, cheap service. So you don't want to do that. You just want to offer something besides that. And uh, that's a good marketing strategy. Um, if you want to attract the cheap customers, then definitely offer that. But you're not going to like the fact that they don't want any other services or they may not pay on time or pay well. So shy away from offering one month free or half off the first month. I, would, I wouldn't advise that. Um, you're in business to make money, you're offering your services, you're offering your uh, professional service and to cut your rate or to cut your initial first month, um, to me is not a good business strategy in this particular industry at least. And then um, you want to make sure that when you're doing the uh, bid that you don't touch anything. Don't um, open up the air relief on the filter, don't touch their automated system, don't pull the autom automatic cleaner to the side to inspect it. Um, don't open up any kind of uh, pump lids. Uh, just keep your hands off everything at the service account because chances are may not happen at this account, but maybe open the air bleeder and the filter at one account and it won't shut. Or you'll. So chances are if you touch anything while you're doing the bid, you may break something, or maybe if you're messing with automatic automated system, you may set something wrong. So my um, advice to you is just talk when you're there, stand by the pool and hands off everything. Don't touch anything. Um, it's not your account yet. And if you break something, you have to come back to the next day uh, with your tail between your legs and fix whatever you break by touching it. So definitely just talk to the customer, be polite, um, use a lot of sirs and ma'ams, you know, just go out of your way to be professional and hands off of everything else. Um, don't be messing with anything to show your skills because that usually backfires. Um, I've had personal experience of that and I've heard different stories from other people where that's a bad idea. Um, and same with the dogs. I, I generally don't try to pet the dogs when I first meet them because you never know what's going to happen. Um, people may think since the dog's barking at you, they don't like you, then you're not a good service person to have back there. So um, everything's minimalized, I think, on the bid. Minimize your talking, minimize any kind of uh, showing off your skills and minimize anything that could uh, cause the customer not to hire you as their service provider, their pool service provider. So those are some tips there as far as that goes. So that's kind of a general overview of some of the mistakes you may make when you're bidding on an account or trying to acquire accounts or building up your business. I could probably do a mini series of these talks um, to help you with starting your business. And this may be the first of many of these podcasts coming down the line. If you need further assistance, if you're a homeowner uh, and you need um, more tips on your pool care, go to my website, swimmingpoollearning.com, and I have an ebook available. I also have a new print version of my book available on Amazon for $19.99. Um, you can check those out. If you do a pool service for a living and you want more one-on-one -on -one help, 
can definitely join my coaching site. I think that the rates that I have my my level set at are extremely low. For $10 a month, you can text me in real time. And for $20 a month, you can call and text me. And I think what I for what I offer, those are extremely low rates. You also get 10% off your general liability insurance. And you get the uh, Riptide Pool Vacuum System with a 10% off discount code. And you also get invited into the group chat I have um, through the GroupMe app where there's um, a lot of pool guys and gals on there. And we post questions and we answer questions for other people on there. So there's a lot of great benefits of joining my coaching site. And I can offer you one-on-one -on -one help with your marketing, with your pricing, and with any kind of problems you may have out there to fine-tune your business. So check that out also. You can find information on my coaching site on my website at swimmingpoollearning.com. So hope you found this podcast helpful. Have a great rest of your week, and God bless. The Pool Guy Podcast Show. The Pool Guy Podcast Show.